I'm Elizabeth Barry Kravis. I'm a pediatric neurologist working at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. And I've specialized in Fragile X and really been working on research in the Fragile X field since 1988. And we've had a clinic where we um, manage patients with Fragile X since 1992. So I've been involved in a lot of translational work to try to develop medications for Fragile X that target, they're not just supportive, but target the underlying disorder. And so what is Fragile X syndrome? It's a single gene disorder. In other words, there's only one gene that's disrupted and that gene is on the X chromosome. So um, in general, boys with fragile X are more impacted than girls because girls have another X chromosome that can compensate for the mutation. In, in fragile X, there's a mutation in a gene called FMR1, which stands for fragile X messenger ribonucleoprotein 1. The gene defect is an expansion of part of the gene at the beginning in like the promoter or the control region of the gene. And there's a repeat, there's a sequence of DNA called CGG and that repeats itself over and over again. And in Fragile X, you get up over 200 repeats. And then for whatever reason, the cell thinks the gene should be shut down, methylates the gene and then shuts it down. So basically in Fragile X, we don't make the product of the Fragile X gene, which is the fMR1 RNA, and then the fMR1 RNA can't make fMRP, which is the Fragile X protein product. And fMRP, it turns out, is kind of a master regulator of protein synthesis in, in neurons. And in fact, it has activity in other cells, but its, it's function seems to be most important in neurons, where if a neuron gets activated, then fMRP is responsible for controlling um, the resulting changes in synthesis of many other proteins that work to um, make a connection stronger or weaker or modify the way brain cells neurons are connected to each other. And so it's a regulator of what we call synaptic plasticity or the ability of synapses or brain connections to change and model themselves so that you can learn and improve your thinking. In Fragile X, fMRP is absent, and that makes it harder for people with Fragile X to modify those brain connections and learn normally. So fMRP regulates a lot of things. It regulates many different um, proteins. And one of the systems it appears to regulate is a system that's called the cyclic AMP signaling system. So cyclic AMP is a molecule that's very important in neural cells to kind of tell the neural cell when something has happened and it needs to change something it's doing. Um, so it's a, it's a modulator of the neural cell activity. Um, cyclic AMP, we discovered a long time ago. In fact, I discovered in 1990 or so that cyclic AMP was deficient, was not being made enough in people, in cells from people with fragile X. Um, and then that was that finding was subsequently repeated in the mouse model of Fragile X and the fly model of Fragile X. And so we know there's this deficiency and lack of normal production of cyclic AMP, which is actually linked to that regulation of protein synthesis by the Fragile X protein FMRP. So this has been known for a long time, and we've always wanted to think of a drug that might target that mechanism. Um, and so a logical drug that might target that me mechanism would be a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Phosphodiesterases are the enzymes that break down cyclic AMP. So if you could break the cyclic AMP down less by inhibiting the phosphodiesterases, then you could have, you could normalize the levels of cyclic AMP, and then maybe you could kind of help with the signaling in the neurons of people with fragile X. So we never really had a chance to test that um, really for many years after knowing about the cyclic AMP abnormality until Tetra developed a drug which um, works on a particular phosphodiesterase, phosphodiesterase 4D in brain. Um, and so the previous phosphodiesterase inhibitors had all 
inhibited all the phosphodiesterases or lots of the phosphodiesterases. And so they were kind of toxic and they caused problems with stomach um, issues and diarrhea and vomiting. And there were a lot of, off, of what we call off target effects or, or symptoms, body symptoms that patients would have had. Um, but this particular phosphodiesterase inhibitor um, would only work in brain, so it wouldn't cause those other problems. Um, so we talked to Tetra, and we did a small study in Fragile X to find out whether there would be support for our theory that using a phosphodiesterase inhibitor would help with that cyclic AMP and therefore help with learning in Fragile X. So um, we did a 30-patient study where we had 15 patients that were on placebo and 15 that were on drug. And then after 12 weeks, the patients flipped over and the ones on drug were on placebo and the ones on placebo were on drug. Um, and what we discovered was that there was an effect of the drug. And even when patients went back to placebo after being on drug, they still had some carryover effect of the drug. So we didn't, we didn't analyze the second period, just the first period. So we had 15 patients that took placebo for three months and 15 patients that took drug for three months. And what we saw was that the people on the drug had an improvement in their ability to learn as measured by um, an iPad test of cognitive function. And particularly they had an improvement in verbal cognition. Um, and then there was a, a corresponding improvement on parent rating scales where parents were rating kind of the most problematic symptoms in terms of language and activities of daily living and behavior. And so we saw improvement in the area of activities of daily living and the area of language. And that went along with this objective test where the patient had to take a test on an iPad and they were able to perform better. And then we also had EEG that we ran in the study. So we put leads on the head and measured the brain activity. There's certain kinds of brain activity, there's certain kinds of ways that brain activity is abnormal in Fragile X. And we were able to normalize some of that brain activity in Fragile X. So in this phase two study, we were able to show that the, um, the, the medication that inhibited the phosphodiesterase 4D, um, which is called Zetomolast, um, was able to normalize both the patient's performance on a cognitive measure, um, the way the fam the ways the family rated how severe their some of their problems were, as well as EEG findings that are characteristic for fragile X. So we we've never had a fragile a study in fragile X where there were where where there was that range of effectiveness in an early phase study, and so for that reason. Um, we've taken the medication into a phase three study, which is many, many more patients, um, to try to understand if we can replicate that finding in a large group of patients with Fragile X, which is what we would need to do to um, get the Zetomolast approved for use in Fragile X, you know, like on a daily basis. Um, so that's that's the effort right now is to do this phase three study and try to determine um, whether we can replicate that result. Um, and we're hopeful that we can, because if we if if we had a drug that helped with like daily functioning and thinking in fragile X, that would be huge because that's really what the what the big problem is in fragile X.